Speaker Stephen Kane is a professor of planetary astrophysics at the University of California, Riverside. He specializes in exoplanetary science and planetary habit, habit, habitability. He received his Bachelor's of Science honors from Macquarie. Macquarie, he, I'm not going to use an Australian accent. Uh, <laughs> and uh, lost my place. And his doctorate from the University of Tasmania. Macquarie's in Sydney, I should add. His work covers a broad range of topics related to planetary astrophysics, and he has discovered and co-discovered hundreds of planets orbiting other stars. He is a leading expert on the topic of planetary, let's see, we're the habitable zone of planetary systems and the study of why Venus and Earth underwent divergent evolutions. He has published hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific papers, as well as several books on the topic of exoplanets and habitability. He is also a prolific advocate of interdisciplinary science through the combination of biology, climate science, geophysics, planetary science, and stellar something. Stellar astrophysics, that was the last word there. So, and the other thing is, so he's pretty darn phenomenal. But the other thing I want to say about Stephen, during uh, the start of the pandemic back in March 2020, Stephen and also uh, Tim Lyons, who was here for the first lecture, they opened up their undergraduate classroom, which went completely virtual online, to all of our UCR Palm Desert Center partners. And it was really great. That was such a strange time for so many of us. And it did give folks the opportunity to think about something that was pretty cool and not so scary. And I know some people in this room attended those classes and we just really appreciate that. That was awesome. All right, let's give him a warm welcome. Stephen Kane. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. And I will say, uh, you're not the only person to struggle with the word habitability. Um, I think that's because I study it and I've been saying it. But I mean, when you think about it, it has a lot of syllables for the number of letters in it. So uh, many, many of my students just refuse to say it. Uh, so, right. Uh, and, and, and I will say it, it was an absolute pleasure for Tim and I to have uh, many of you in the classroom with us during the pandemic, as we spoke about astrobiology, uh, was was really great that we were able to share that experience together. So thank you to those who who joined. Uh, it, it was really great for all of us, I think. Uh, so uh, thank you for inviting me back out. Uh, of course, the last time I was here was right before the pandemic, and. Uh, and, and back then, I was talking to you uh, more generally about the search for exoplanets, but one of my deep loves uh, is the planet Venus and trying to understand it. And there's been a number of developments regarding Venus science over the last couple of years that I think you'll all be very interested to hear about. And uh, the, the reason in particular that I'm very, uh, very obsessed uh, with the planet Venus is because it is Earth's twin, uh, but it turned out completely differently. And we still don't understand why. And I think that's an important uh, piece of information that we as a civilization will want to know because it can have a profound impact on Earth's history or how what we understand about possible trajectories uh, for for Earth. So that's what I'm going to be telling you about today, some updates about, about Venus and, and how that teaches us about Earth. But before I do that, I want to step back. And uh, let's see if my... All right. I think that now it's just took a few moments for this to connect. <laughs> I wanted to step back a little bit when, uh, and talk about the search for planets around other, other stars, because this has uh, been originally a huge motivation for me and for many others. You know that the, that the whole topic about this lecture series, Are We Alone? Search for Life in the Universe. And one of the things that uh, I often remind my students about is, of course, we are not 
the first people to be thinking about this. This is a topic which has been around for thousands of years in recorded history and undoubtedly well before that, because if you go back to the Greek philosophers such as Epicurus, who popularized this idea of the plurality of worlds, and this idea that there are probably many planets out there and some of them may have life like Earth. However, they didn't have really the scientific means to which to back up some of these claims. And so what we are very fortunate to be living through right now is actually witnessing the technology catching up to these ideas that have been around since antiquity. And so one example that I, uh, more recent than Epicurus that I like to give is the case of Giordano Bruno, because Giordano Bruno was a very fascinating person who had a lot of ideas. And this is one of uh, my favorite quotes from him, because he said, there are countless suns and countless earths all rotating around their, their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. Now, I always like to ask this question, because you have to look at the time at which this was said. This is a quote from 1584, and he said seven planets. And so this preceded the discovery of Uranus and Neptune, which required the use of the telescope. And so then we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So that's six. What is number seven? Moon, of course. Of course it was, because this was uh, actually during the time when the Copernican Revolution was happening, but it was not yet widely accepted. And so many people at this point still subscribe to the geocentric view. And in that view, with the Earth at the center, the moon is one of the planets. He goes on to say that we see only the suns because they're the largest bodies and are luminous, but their planets remain invisible to us because they are smaller and non-luminous. The countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our Earth. Now, I'm able to stand before you right now and be very cavalier about talking about this topic, but we should always remember that there were numerous points in, in, in human history when doing so would come at potentially the cost of your own life. And so this was a, one of those periods. Saying things like this could upset some people and some very powerful people. And you would be right if you assumed that it's that last sentence that got him into a lot of trouble, uh, along with many other things that he said. But I actually want to focus on the middle sentence because Giordano Bruno identified the main problem that we have in trying to find planets around other stars. Like I said, it, the technology had to catch up to the ideas. Why was this so important? Because Giordano recognized that trying to find a planet around another star is Called because you are looking for a very faint object right next to a very, very, very bright object, the star that it's orbiting. And this makes it extremely challenging and still remains challenging today. And so there are numerous ways in which we can this. Is there do, do one of these one? Yeah, just use, I think that would be better. <laughs> testing, testing. It's, well, it's good to know it's not me or, or you. <laughs> All right, can you hear me okay? All right, great. So what Jordana was talking about was the direct detection of a planet, seeing it directly. But there is another approach, and we call that approach an indirect way of finding planets. That means that you don't necessarily see the planet itself, but you observe the effects that it has on its surroundings. And the easiest thing to observe is the star. And so if, if we can observe the way in which that planet affects the star it's orbiting, uh, then we can infer the presence of the planet. And there are two main ways in which we can do that. The first is the uh, one that's shown in the animation at the top, which is what we refer to as the wobble method. This is the planet literally making the star wobble. And that is a gravitational effect. Uh, because, for example, when we talk about the Earth and the Moon, we talk about the Moon orbiting the Earth. But strictly speaking, the Earth and the Moon both orbit around their center of mass. 
the moon has mass, and so when the moon is going around the Earth, it is making the Earth. The same thing is happening with stars. And so when a planet is orbiting a star, from our perspective, it is making the star wobble. And that is something that we can measure as, that as the star is moving away and towards us. So the other main method that we use to infer the presence of a planet is something we call the transit method, and that's shown in this bottom diagram here. And in that method, it's actually very, very simple. If the planet passes between us and the star, it blocks out some of the light from the star. And we can measure that if we're able to measure the brightness of the stars to enough precision then we can infer the presence of a planet that blocks out the light from the star temporarily. And in this bottom method known as transit method, you have to have the orbit aligned exactly towards you. So not all planets are going to do this, but if you look at enough stars and observe enough of these transits, you can start to get an idea of of how many planets there might be out there. The top one is a gravitational method, so it means you measure the mass of the planet. This method, the transit method, blocking out the light, means that you measure the size of the planet. So these two methods tell you there's a planet there and give you different kinds of information about it. However, measuring like the brightness of a star to enough precision to see a transit is actually a little bit harder than it sounds. Uh, not the least of which reason is because we're looking through the Earth's atmosphere. And you've probably heard this analogy before that looking through the Earth's atmosphere when you're looking at the stars is akin to looking at an object that's sitting at the bottom of a pool. And the Earth's atmosphere is making the light move around all over the place and creating a distorted image, which is of course why stars twinkle. Astronomers, if they had their way, would get rid of the Earth's atmosphere, which is why we shouldn't allow astronomers to be in charge of too much. But we can solve this much more easily and much more safely than getting rid of the Earth's atmosphere, and that is, of course, going to space. And so in 2009, we, des uh, we launched a mission that we had designed specifically for the purpose of staring at stars to measure their brightness continuously for a period of about five years and seeing if there were any changes in their brightness that might be due to a planet which is orbiting it. And so this, the, uh, the Kepler telescope was launched not into an Earth orbit, like the Hubble Space Telescope, but it was actually deployed into an Earth trailing orbit so that it followed the Earth around the sun. And so that meant that the enormous and bright disk of the Earth wasn't in the way when it wanted to continuously stare at 170,000 stars, as I said, for about five years, and measure changes in the brightness of those stars. And it was enormously successful mission first insight into how common planets the size of the Earth could be. This is a diagram which summarizes the results of the Kepler mission. So what you can see here on the vertical axis is the size of the planet relative to the Earth, because remember that's what the transit method measures. It measures the size of the planet. And then on the horizontal axis here, there's how long the planet takes to orbit its star what we refer to as the orbital period. And we've got some standard units of measurement associated with planets that we see in our own solar system. We see Earth, we see Neptune, which is about four times the size of the Earth, and then we have Jupiter, which is about 10 times the size of the Earth. Now, getting out to where Earth is, because Earth, of course, has an orbital period of 365 days, which would put it around about here. You can see that there doesn't seem to be much down here. And that's not because there aren't any planets that exist in that region, that's just the limit of the sensitivity of the Kepler spacecraft. But what you can see is that these large planets are relatively rare. These are the ones which we can most easily find. A large planet passing in front of its star stands out enormously in the data. So we see those first. 
But what you can see is the density of these points increases as we go further down right up until the sensitivity limit of Kepler. And so this told us something which had been intuitive, but it just never measured. And that is small planets are much more common than larger planets. And the reason I say it's intuitive is if you think, for example, of a pile of rubble, then you expect a couple of the large boulders, you expect many more of the large rocks, many, many more of the smaller rocks. By the time you get to things like the pebbles and the grains of sand, you can no longer count them anymore. It turns out the planet formation works in the same way. It's harder to form larger planets. There are fewer of them, but there are many, many small planets. And this is, of course, great, great news for astrobiology. This is one of the one of the features of the Drake equation. For those of you who are familiar with the work of Frank Drake, one of these key pieces of information that actually start to tell us whether or not Epicurus and Bruno were right in their statements that small planets were very, very common. All we need to figure out now, if their further statements that, and they're full of life like the Earth, if those are also correct. And that's why we need to move on to the next stage of our observations. And so I'm sure many of you are aware that the James Webb Space Telescope was successfully launched. Uh, I don't know if you actually watched the launch, like I, as I recall it launched at something like 4.30 or five o'clock in the morning on, on Christmas day. And I, I stayed up that whole night just playing video games on launch happened, <laughs> along with many people in my research group, and it was an enormously successful launch. Uh, and by enormously successful, I mean, many of you may be familiar that there were numerous things that had to unfold, many of these unfolding pieces being deployed on its way far away from the Earth, similar to Kepler, so that it can observe unobstructed whichever target it's looking at. There are many things which could go wrong. This, the, the deployment of the solar sail was the part that had people the most nervous because these were held under tension in the spacecraft and so they were just released and it was hoped that all would go well. And it did. Not only did everything go well with the unfolding of the space, but the course corrections were, were essentially negligible. What that means is that the original design with the fuel was that it would have a lifetime of about five years. But because no course corrections were needed, now it has an expected lifetime of about 20 years. And so James Webb is going to be providing us data for a, a long, long time. And it's an exciting time for this to be happening because one of the primary uses of the James Webb telescope is the kind of work that I do, which is looking at the atmospheres of the small planets that were found around other stars. So how do we do that? Well, is we use the trick or a byproduct of the transit method. Remember that when the transit method, the planet passes between us and the star. And what that means for us is that if we happen to be looking at that star, when the planet passes between us and the star, then that means the light from the star passes through the atmosphere on its way to us. It passes through the atmosphere, and as it passes through the atmosphere, the composition of, of that atmosphere will absorb that light at very, very specific wavelengths. For example, if it has a, an oxygen-dominated atmosphere, or a carbon dioxide-dominated atmosphere, or a methane-dominated atmosphere, or combinations of these will have their own unique fingerprint when we conduct these observations with James Webb Space Telescope. And so that's what we are doing right now. And there's a couple of, uh, of particular planets I'll tell you about in a moment, but these are, the, uh, these are the observations that are currently going on. And now that we know that the planets are there, what could they actually be like on the surface? And I'm sure my colleague Eddie Schweidemann uh, who's, who spoke to you recently, his area of particular expertise is looking for biological signatures 
uh, within the atmospheres of these planets. So when we obtain a measurement of the atmospheres of these planets, what we ideally hope to see is something like this. This is what we call a spectrum, a spectrum of a planetary atmosphere. And in this case, I'm actually showing uh, the example of Earth. What would Earth look like if you were to obtain a spectrum of the Earth? And when you look at a, a spectrum of the Earth, you see absorption features. This is what I mentioned earlier about the light from the star being absorbed by particular molecules. Absorption features that correspond to different processes that are going on, mostly at the surface. Some of them are biological, some of them are geological, but they're all telling us about an overall picture which is going on. Eddie, for example, is particularly interested in ozone and how ozone could be a very important biosignature, uh, as opposed to just regular molecular oxygen, which can be produced for example, from volcanic emission. Uh, but we look for uh, other things such as water. You can see here it says water vapor and suggests habitability. And so now here is uh, where I'm going to enter a phase of my talk where I'm going to use that word habitability. <laughs> Hopefully we'll all have come away from this talk if nothing else. Uh, <laughs> figuring out how to say the word. So, so um, I'm going to use that word quite a bit because that's a really interesting concept. I don't know if you've thought that much about water and means for habitability, uh, but this is something that myself and my research group think about all the time because this is what I'm more interested in. As I said, Eddie uh, is more interested in the biosignature component. I'm more interested in the planetary processes that are able to sustain surface liquid water on a planet, especially for a long period of time. Because this is one of the most amazing things. This is something that Tim has always said to me, and it's always struck me uh, when Tim says to me, you, you know, Stephen, one of the most amazing things about Earth is that it has had surface liquid water for almost its entire history. Which when somebody first tells you that, you, you may have a tendency to just shrug your shoulders and go, uh, uh, okay, that's, that, that's cool, I guess. But then you think about it and you realize what that means is that the surface of Earth has remained within a narrow range of temperatures, say between zero and 100 degrees, for more than 4 billion years. That is incredible. How does the Earth get away with that? How is it able to pull off this trick? And this is uh, one of the things I think about quite a lot. But before we even start thinking about this, why should we even care? Well, there's a number of reasons why we might care about liquid water. So one of the things that people sometimes say is, well, we know that water is important for life because wherever we find water, we find life. Now that's not an argument that I, I'm particularly enthralled with because life has been around on the earth for about 4 billion years. It, the earth I, desc I describe as has been uh, completely and utterly con contaminated with life at this point. It's burrowed deep into the earth's crust. In other words, wherever you find anything, you find life on earth. And this is why, of course, we have to work so hard to decontaminate anything we want to send, certainly to the surface of Mars, but also to places like Europa or other places where we're interested in the places that might have some possibility of an ecosystem. Uh, but there are some very nice properties of water. One thing that is extremely common uh, it is a natural, a very neutral solvent. Almost anything dissolves in water. It has that, it has that high reactivity because it's composed of two of the most common elements in the universe, hydrogen and oxygen. If you think there's a lot of water on Earth, you should check out the outer solar system because the Earth is actually described as relatively dry. The fact that we even have continents means that we don't have nearly as much water as we could have. And even the single moon Europa 
is much smaller than the earth, has way more water than earth does. So there's a lot of water that's out there. So that's great. It's very, very abundant. It's a neutral solvent in which you can have biochemical reactions take place. Could you still substitute it with something else? Sure, but there are other, some other possibilities, but all of the other possibilities require much colder temperatures to be in a liquid state, such as we see on Saturn's moon Titan, for example. Uh, and when you have a very, very cold liquid, you can still have some of these kinds of biochemical reactions, but they will progress at a much, much slower rate. And so water is, for these reasons and many others, water is considered to be fundamental. It certainly has been very, very important for life on Earth. And so you may have heard NASA has a mantra called follow the water. It's trying to understand where the water is in the universe and hopefully we'll find life along the way. And so one of the things that I can say myself is, okay, if water is important, then where is it? How do we determine if we look at a planet that that planet could have water or not? Now, this is where it becomes extremely complicated. This topic of planetary habitability depends on a great many things. Uh, and this is a diagram, by the way, uh, which is colloquially referred to as the planets are hard diagram, because it's the exercise of going down the rabbit hole of if you require that you have put water on the surface of your planet, what are all the things that can affect that? Obviously, energy from the sun. The sun is by far the dominant source of energy for the energy balance of our planet and indeed almost all planets. And so the star, the kind of star, how long it lives and whether it's an extremely active star or not. There are many properties of the star that matter. There are many properties of the planetary system that matter, whether you have other planets like a giant planet like Jupiter. Does, uh, does us having a uh, several giant planets in our solar system, does that matter? Because many, uh, most systems actually don't have any giant planets. And so Jupiter may be important, may have changed the orbit of Earth. It may have sent material inward. A lot of the water that I spoke about earlier may have been delivered in no small part because of the effect of Jupiter. So other planets can have a big effect. But the planet itself, what are the properties of the planet that really matter? And of course, you can think of things like the geology, the atmosphere, and a lot of these depend on where the planet formed, how big the planet is. And so when we're thinking about a lot of these topics, we of course become anthropic. When we look at this, we can't help but see this picture in the middle and think of the only planet that we know of that has surface liquid water, and that is Earth. And like I said, Earth being able to pull off this trick of maintaining that surface liquid water for more than 4 billion years is extraordinary. And we might be tempted to think that that is therefore an intrinsic property of planets, which are the mass and the size of the Earth. And so one thing that really helps with trying to trying to understand why is the Earth special? Is the Earth special? Or are there, are there proce what are the processes that really matter? If only we had a planet that was the size of the Earth that would allow us to explore this in more detail. If only we had twin planets where we could explore a different pathway then maybe understand what makes the earth special and this put it to you is where the universe has been extraordinarily kind to us because it gave us just that uh it gave us the planet venus now uh venus i'm sure many of you are aware is named after the latin or the roman goddess of beauty and love uh and the greeks called it out and I sometimes tell my, my, my students, you know, who are generally too busy looking at their phones to, to, to look up even when there's a lunar eclipse happening. But I tell them, whether you know it or not, you have seen Venus. It is the third brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon. You have seen it. Maybe you just didn't know what you were looking at or thought it was called 911. 
has happened many, many, many times. Uh, it is extremely beautiful and extremely bright because of the thick layer of clouds. And this is a, a, an image that is from the Japanese spacecraft, a cat which has been orbiting this since 2010 and continues to return extraordinary images, actually imaging in the ultraviolet, which is why you can see a lot of the layers in the clouds that you wouldn't necessarily see in uh, optical wavelengths. Um, one of the uh, interesting things about Venus and trying to study Venus is, is it's subject very much to what I mentioned earlier about the problems with the Earth's atmosphere. Because Venus is closer to the sun than the Earth, it means it's always at the, near the horizon, whether it be in the morning or in the evening, it means that we're always looking through a lot of the Earth's atmosphere in order to see it, and we've got a very limited window in which to conduct those observations. It's one of these counterintuitive things that the in the sky is actually one of the hardest objects to observe from the ground in many of the meaning that we would like to. But one of the most interesting things about Venus, of course, is that we now know that if we strip away the atmosphere of Venus, this is what it looks like underneath. And it is one of the most inhospitable places, certainly in the solar system, and perhaps in many other uh, planetary systems as well. This is a kind of representation of what you might expect as the opposite of habitability, the very opposite end of the spectrum of an interesting situation. We have two planets the same size that seems to not only be uh, slightly different, but completely different and at all ends of what we a habitable planet. Interesting things about this is that this is only a relatively recent realization. One of the classes that I teach at UCSide is a class called Planets in Science Fiction. And uh, as, along with the astrobiology class that I teach with Tim, uh, it's, it's, it's a class that I, I, I love to teach. Uh, and uh, it is, once again, for non-science majors. And I talk a lot about uh, how planets have, have evolved in literature, how they've inspired a lot of literature. Uh, and uh, you know, when I first proposed the class to the Committee for Courses, I, I, I thought, I, I'm never going to get away with teaching a class that's just me being a nerd. Um, and uh, not only uh, the feedback I received for the committee of, of courses is not only did they approve it, but they all wanted to take it. So well, it's been a great class. But one of the things I talk about is how our ideas of planets just in our own solar system have been inspired by science fiction and backwards and forwards. And of course, we're all familiar with a lot of the work that surrounds that on Mars. And so the evolution of ideas about there being an intelligent civilization on Mars, particularly uh, in the late 19th century from Percival Lowell and others who popularized these ideas, of course, led to H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds and many other works of fiction. However, Mars has a very thin atmosphere and we were very quickly able to see through to the surface and realize there actually wasn't anything going on there and there certainly wasn't any canals. Attention at that point, to Venus and during the 40s and 50s and 60s was a real boon for science fiction when it came to Venus because Venus has this thick atmosphere you can't see through it's the same size as the earth and many of the depictions were of a hot humid jungle environment many of them had dinosaurs many many of them had dinosaurs uh, and some of our very last depictions of the surface of Venus. This is 1959, by the way, a Three Stooges film. It's a, has anybody seen this film? It's very strange. <laughs> they go to Venus and they talk to a giant fire-breathing tarantula and an invisible unicorn and then evil versions of themselves. Uh, it's, it's, so it's a, it's a Three Stooges film. But in 1965, Voyage to the Prehistoric Planet, which incidentally is available in its entirety on YouTube, if you do want to watch it. And it's extraordinary because this was our last Hollywood film which depicted American astronauts going to the surface of Venus to actually understand what was happening. It was an imperative at, at the time. And uh, 
imperative that not only the Americans became obsessed with, but nobody became more obsessed with this whole concept that the life on Venus than Soviet Russia, because uh, it became an incredible part of the space race that was occurring at that time. And Soviet Russia was determined that they were going to beat the Americans to this, and they started firing everything that they could, the kid could think, yes, in a program that was called the Venera. The Venera program was extremely successful, and there's a whole interesting story about the Venera program because Soviet Russia uh, had a policy that they did not report failures. And so even when they would do things like miss Venus or the very first Venera didn't even make it out of Earth orbit, they said, we meant to do it. That was exactly what we intended. And some of the, uh, some of the uh, earlier Veneras, they claimed la landed on Venus, but the American Mariner program, which was flying by Venus and started to get some actual measurements of what the surface conditions or at least what lower limits on what they could be, said there's absolutely no way that your spacecraft was strong enough to land on the surface of Venus. At which point the, the Soviets had to embarrassingly backpedal and say, oh yeah, whoops, sorry, we didn't mean to say that. But they did have extraordinary success and their later missions uh, were land, landing on the surface and the very first image from the surface of another planet was returned from the Venera program because they preceded the Vikings. So uh, they returned some amazing images, and this is one from later on in the Venera program. Venera 13 uh, landed and uh, it lasted 127 minutes at the surface. It returned this color image before it did, and we started to build a picture of the full extent of how terrible the surface of Venus is. So how terrible is it? Well, uh, I noticed a few years ago that the maximum temperature on my barbecue is approximately the surface temperature of Venus, which is 850 degrees Fahrenheit, 450 degrees Celsius for my metric friends. <laughs> so not only is it hot, but it also has extremely high atmospheric pressure. It has an average pressure at the surface of about 93 times the atmospheric pressure on Earth. That's actually really hard for most people to think about because honestly, we don't really think about the Earth's atmosphere unless there's a strong wind. And the atmospheric pressure on Venus is equivalent to about one kilometer depth in the ocean, which is well below the safe scuba diving depth. Not only that, it has sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. It's completely dominated by carbon dioxide at about the 96% level. And it also has lightning. So it means that if you were on uh, the unfortunate situation of being on the surface of Venus, then you would be melted, dissolved, and electrocuted all at once. <laughs> so, so what, what do we do with this? Because now we have a planet the same size as the Earth, but it is the opposite. How did things end up this way? And this has been a real mystery that a lot of my colleagues have been thinking about a lot. Uh, because one of my uh, one of my colleagues, who uh, his name is Francois Forget, and he's a, a leading expert on the topic of climate models and applying them not just to Earth but to Mars. Uh, he even applied it to Pluto during the New Horizons flyby, and he has applied his models to Venus. And here's what he had to say about Venus. He said, if Venus did not exist in our solar system, we would not dare to imagine it. Meaning that we might think that if we did not have Venus, if you can imagine with me for a moment this actual scenario, that the solar system consisted of Mercury, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Then how cavalier we would be actually about correlating planetary habitability in the presence of liquid water with the size of the planet. We would be very, uh, we're very much prone to doing that and we would be completely wrong because here is a, a, an opposite example. 
And so Francois Fouché was saying that not only would our current models not predict this, but we wouldn't even imagine that such a thing could exist. And it's a very stark warning to us. Why is this the case? Well, what we do understand about Venus is that it has what we call a runaway greenhouse, or it has had that in the past. We actually refer to Venus now as being in a post-runaway greenhouse state. In other words, it's still not continuing to get hotter. It has reached a new equilibrium after this process of changing its atmosphere. And the changing of the atmosphere means that a lot of the infrared radiation is trapped at the surface. One of the captive things about uh, the surface of Venus, which is that whereas about 45% of the, of the sunlight that hits the top of the Earth's atmosphere makes it all the way to the surface, Venus, it's only about 3% of the light from the sun makes it to the surface, which might make you think, wouldn't that mean it's cold? Well, the problem is, all of the radiation that makes it in is stuck, whereas Earth is constantly re-radiating back into, into space. And so over time, that has produced the extremely hostile environments that we now see. And the trouble is, is that we cannot, from our models, transition from this situation to this situation. A lot of the physics changes when you produce such a hostile atmosphere. And so this is an extreme challenge and why Francois Forget suggested that we wouldn't have predicted this. So this is a big problem when we're looking at the atmospheres of planets around other stars. Because another way to think about this is if we look at the limited inventory of terrestrial atmospheres that we have within our solar system. We have Venus, we have Earth, we have Mars, we have Titan. Titan actually has significantly more atmosphere than Mars does. Mars has, uh, has a very, very small, relatively speaking, atmosphere. But what these percentages are showing are the percentage of the total atmospheric mass for terrestrial objects in the solar system. And what you can see is that almost all the atmospheric mass is on Venus. And this is the atmosphere that we know the least about. We don't know how it happened. We don't understand the chemistry of most of it. And that means that when we're using the James Webb to look at planets around other stars, then this is a significant problem for us because it means that we have this giant question mark on the vast majority of the atmospheric mass of the solar system. So what are some of, the, some of the problems? I keep telling you that Venus is a big mystery, but I'll just mention a, a couple of things. There's an, a number of things that I could go into, but obviously we want to understand how it got this way. And one of the primary ways is we do this is by comparing to Earth. Going back to the uh, original uh, point about Earth having water for most of its history. Well, there are some, some significant differences between Venus and Earth. Venus's surface seems to be already relatively young, meaning less than a billion years old. There seems to have been an event in Venus's past that could have resurfaced the whole planet. And we don't really understand why that happened. We want to understand if it could have plate tectonics like the Earth, and I'll get back to that in a moment. And what we really want to understand is did Venus have a period where it did have surface liquid water? Did Venus ever have these oceans that made it like the Earth? And what are the major factors that may have caused them to be different? Because there are many, many differences between Venus and Earth, which I'll get back to in a moment. But you'll see that that background picture looks like a habitable planet. And you may have actually thought that's Earth. It's not. This is an artist's depiction of what Venus may have looked like as recently as a billion years ago. And so, and we've conducted enough models of an atmosphere of a, of a planet like Venus that is at its current distance of the sun and it can maintain surface liquid water. So what do I mean when I say that there are many, many differences between Venus and Earth? Because isn't 
Venus, Earth's twin? Well, usually when we look at Venus and Earth and we put them side by side, one thing that we do know is that Venus is 30% closer to the sun, and as a result, it receives about twice the amount of solar energy. And for many years, people assumed that was the answer, that we can, we can wipe our hands of the whole thing and just to go home. It's closer to the sun, and so it was pushed into a runaway greenhouse. But it's not the whole story, because Venus also rotates very, very slowly. Does that matter? Rotation rate of the planet has a profound effect on the climate. And when we run models of a potentially habitable Venus that has mostly one side facing towards the sun, then what we find is that there's a lot of evaporation that forms clouds on the day side of the planet and cools it and actually keeps it habitable for a long period of time. It has almost no uh, tilt to its rotational axis, whereas the Earth it's 23 and a half degrees, but Venus it's basically straight up and down, and so it doesn't experience seasons in the same way. It doesn't seem to have any surface subduction, meaning plate tectonics. It doesn't seem to have any magnetic field. So insofar as that's a problem, it doesn't have a substantial moon, which is another uh, rabbit hole I won't go into here. Uh, but a lot of people look at uh, uh, the example of the Earth's moon and say, well, we are here. The Earth's moon is here. There must be a connection. And maybe there is. But we don't fully understand what that connection uh, is. Uh, other than the moon exerting tidal forces and creating tidal pools where you can get an acceleration of biochemistry. But maybe that has had a huge effect on the overall history of the two planets. I want to uh, draw your attention to uh, a, just a couple of major things that, we, that might help us to understand what the solution to all of this is. And one of these is simply looking at the interaction between the atmosphere and the surface. This is actually a very old image, a topographical map of the surface of Venus. And what you can see there is that there are two major continents. There's the major equatorial continent called Aphrodite Terra, and there is a major continent near the North Pole called Ishtar Terra. Well, what we have observed from the Japanese spacecraft, Akatsuki, is that there's a lot of interaction that happens between the atmosphere of Venus and the surface. And this could be really, really important because one of the things that we ask ourselves is what, what is a, the, the climate on planets that have one side pace, uh, facing towards their star, what are they really like? And Venus gives us the first indication of that. Because what we do know is that the atmosphere of Venus is about 100 times more massive than the Earth. As I mentioned, at the surface, it's equivalent to one kilometer depth in the ocean. What we also know is that, as I mentioned, only 3% of the sunlight top of the atmosphere reaches the surface. That means almost everything else is injected into the atmosphere. A lot of it is reflected into space, of course, which is why it appears so bright in the evening sky and the morning sky. But everything else is injected into the atmosphere. That means the atmosphere of Venus has a lot of energy and it actually rotates very, very quickly. Although the rotation period of Venus is about 243 days, the rotation period of the atmosphere is only four days. And so that means that it's rotating, the top of the atmosphere is rotating very quickly. And we actually see bow shocks in the atmosphere in the same way as you would see for a ship passing through the ocean. And this is a bow shock of this extremely thick atmosphere passing over the equatorial continent of Aphrodite Terra and actually changing the rotation rate of the planet in real time. So the other significant piece I wanted to draw your attention to is going back to this whole thing about plate tectonics. As I said, how does the Earth get away with this incredible trick it has pulled for more than 4 billion years? Well, a key to that seems to be 
the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by subducting it into the interior of Earth. Now, the big difference with Venus is Venus has what we refer to as a stagnant lead surface. Stagnant lead, meaning that there's little to no movement of the crust going on. And this is extremely important because the tectonics on Earth are a major, major contributor to the regulation of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. Of course, we are disrupting that now with human intervention. But usually this is a process which is operating over hundreds of thousands of years. Carbon dioxide is removed, it's dissolved into the ocean, and it's weathered out through rain and brought into the Earth's interior and then released again through volcanic emission. Well, uh, if Venus once had that ability and then lost it, then that would mean that it would have had nowhere to put its carbon except for its atmosphere. And so that could be a major reason why Venus ended up the way that it did if it's lost this fundamental trick that the Earth has been able to pull off for so many years. Uh, one of the recent discoveries, which is giving some insight into this, is trying to understand if Venus is still volcanically active. Uh, this has been one of the fundamental questions about Venus for many years. Many people have suspected that it is, we just didn't have any direct evidence. And so people have been looking for signs of active volcanism on the surface of Venus. And uh, recently, a month ago, I was at the Lunar Planetary Science Conference in Houston. And at that conference, a colleague of mine by the name of Robbie Herrick, who's at uh, Jet Propulsion, he made an incredible announcement where he had been looking at the surface of Venus for a long, long time and studying data from the Magellan mission, which was a NASA mission during the 90s. And it was actually a result of the pandemic believe it or not, because he was at home bored. And so he was looking at this data because people wondered, this data is from the 90s. How come we're only finding this out now? Well, you just needed the right person, Robbie, who's an expert on craters, just looking at this data during the pandemic. And he discovered that the, looking at images that were eight months apart, that there was a particular uh, uh, what we thought is the extinct volcano and it filled up with lava during the during those eight months and produced a lava flow across the surface of the planet. So this is extraordinary because it means that Venus is indeed volcanically active. It's still pumping carbon dioxide into its atmosphere as we speak. So what does all this mean? It could mean that what we're observing in our solar system is a dichotomy, a true dichotomy, where if you start with an Earth-sized planet, you can follow one of two pathways. You can, you can follow a pathway towards having a habitable planet or a completely uninhabitable planet like Venus. And the reason behind this fork in the road is whether you can regulate carbon dioxide in your atmosphere or not through plate tectonics and through subduction of the carbon. That could be the answer. We only have those two examples in our solar system, so we need to be careful when you only have two in your sample. The answer could be that there's all kinds of alternatives. And that's why we're looking for, uh, for similar kind of planets around other stars, what I refer to as exo-Venus. Uh, and so just to quickly wrap up here, because I know that we're running out of time, uh, I just want to tell you about are, which is we're using the James Webb Space Telescope specifically to look at the atmospheres of these planets to determine whether they're like Venus or whether they're like Earth. As I said, my, Ed, uh, my, my colleague Eddie is most particularly looking for biosignatures. I'm looking for almost the opposite. I'm looking for signs of a dead planet, a planet that has uh, turned into a post-runaway greenhouse state like Venus, and so could tell us if Earth is the normal case or if Venus is the normal case. 
or maybe both of them are weird. And this is something that we need to figure out. But the good news that we've learned is that Venus analogs appear to be common. And we know this from research that I've done by just looking at how many discoveries from Kepler are in a region which, are, which is close to this, which may indicate that they're pushed into a runaway greenhouse state. Yesterday marked the five year anniversary of the launch of the Transient Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is a successor to Kepler and is monitoring the whole and uh, myself and my students have been looking at the data uh, from tests and looking at which one of these are going to be the perfect candidates to follow up with the James Webb telescope. And so we've identified a few candidates and uh, these have currently been observed and we're looking at the data right now. And one of these, the one on the right is a very well-known system you may have heard before called the TRAPPIST. And the TRAPPIST-1 system is amazing because it has a whole lot of terrestrial planets spanning from very close to the star to far away from the star. That means we're kind of sampling as a function of distance from the star what the atmospheres of terrestrial planets ends up looking like. There was the recent result from the TRAPPIST system very interesting that the inner planet doesn't actually have an atmosphere. And so not only is it not like Venus, it's not like anything in our solar system, except for you argue Mercury, except it's even more massive than the Earth. Its atmosphere has been blown away because it's close to the star. And so clearly there's some limits to this that we're starting to think about. How does the the uh, atmospheric erosion from the star, how does that play a role in this? And could this actually prevent a planet or turning into anything like Venus if all of its atmosphere is removed? So what we have coming up next is a couple of really exciting missions. We're currently in the era of the James Space Telescope. We have coming up soon what's called here W first, but is now called the Roman Space Telescope. And that's going to be actually a very key mission because it's going to be solving the issue that Giordano Bruno first mentioned, because that is a mission that will be able to directly image planets around other stars, giant planets like Jupiter. However, what's coming next are the New Worlds telescopes, the habitable exoplanet imager, and those will be to directly image planets like Venus and planets like Earth. And we'll finally be able to solve Giordano's uh, dream of directly imaging an exoplanet. The technology will finally have caught up to its ideas. But, uh, but that will be fantastic because we'll be seeing solar system analogs where we directly see a potential Venus, and which is the normal kind of situation. The most exciting thing for me during the pandemic was the announcement that NASA is back in the Venus business. Uh, there was a selection of four missions. Uh, one was to Jupiter, one was to Neptune, and two were to Venus, and only two were going to be selected. So I thought we've got a 50-50 chance of getting a Venus mission. And both missions were selected. I'm, happily, I'm on the, on the team for both of these missions. And so this is very, very exciting. Da Vinci is going to drop a probe into the atmosphere and it's going to return to the surface for the first time in decades. And the, and the purpose of Da Vinci will be to study the chemistry of the atmosphere so we can finally solve that problem that Francois Forget mentioned about trying to model the transition from something like an Earth-like planet to a, a Venus-like planet. And the Veritas mission will be mapping the surface of Venus to a higher resolution than we've ever been able to do before. So that's all wonderful news that we're, that we're finally returning to Venus and trying to uncover the mysteries of our twin planet. And so I'll just finish by saying that 
Uh, why is why is this so so important? Well, I'll, I'll just end with a with a, a, a little story. The way I imagine this is: imagine that you live in a beautiful, idyllic village, and it's a beautiful place to live. Everybody's happy. There is another village that you can see from your village that looks like it was the same size, but it's burnt to the ground. Now you ask around the people who live in your village, how did that happen? Nobody knows. You ask them, when did that happen? No, nobody knows the answer. And then you ask the penultimate question, could that happen to us? Nobody knows the answer. That's the situation that we're in. And I think that what we really need to do more than anything else is to understand the conditions that control the surface habitability of a planet and how they can change with time and what that could mean for the Earth. Because Venus could represent the end state of all terrestrial planets. It could be that all planets, Earth and otherwise, eventually turn into a post runaway greenhouse state where all of the carbon is in the atmosphere and the planet is effectively dead for all, all kinds of biological activity at the surface. So I will end there, but thank you very much for your attention. Well, that was kind of a depressing note to end on. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll come right to you first with the microphone. Please speak into the microphone. Hold it close so that we can hear you. What do we need to do to tell if a planet has plate tectonics? That's a really good question because I've, I've essentially implied very strongly that that may be one of the most fundamental features of a planet. And a lot of people have, have been thinking this way. Most of the way in which we think about uh, how we would do that now with the technology we have now, such as James Webb uh, looking at the atmosphere of a planet as the starlight passes through it, uh, is if there's volcanic activity. Now, as I've said, that may not be the indicator that we thought it was because up until recently, it wasn't clear that Venus had volcanic emission. Now we know that Venus does have volcanic activity. That means that volcanic activity is common to both plate tectonics and stagnant lid planets. And so it's not necessarily an indicator, but a lot of people are thinking about if there is strong volcanic activity, that that might least indicate that there's some kind of movement of the, of the crust of the planet Otherwise, you couldn't have that kind of strong act, uh, activity. And what I mean by that is, if you uh, if you remember uh, back in 2010, there was a, a significant volcano in Iceland, uh, which shut down the North Atlantic air traffic for a while and uh, upset a lot of people. Which I thought was weird because you know the planet is doing its thing and we get upset about going about first class on a plane, uh, but. The thing is that that reason that stopped air traffic is because it stayed pretty much in the troposphere, whereas some of the Chilean volcanoes have had a sustained presence in the stratosphere. Now, if we can have uh, significant volcanic events which have uh, sustained activity in the upper levels of the planetary atmosphere, we can currently detect that. And so that's the sort of thing that we're looking for as a, as a first level indicator. But it's a really hard problem to understand for sure if it, if it has currently has plate tectonics or not. I have a question over here. Yeah, can you explain something very simple? Why are the planets pretty much spherical in shape? So uh, that is uh, a, a phenomenon which we call hydrostatic equilibrium, which is beyond a certain size, uh, objects are essentially become round as, as they form. And to see a good example of this, then you just need to look at the, uh, of the moons of the giant planets. Jupiter is actually a bad example of this because essentially it, it only has four major moons, the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and everything else is pr 
pretty much tiny. <laughs> but, it, but if you look at something like the moons of Saturn, and in particular Uranus, they're much more diverse. And the interesting thing about Saturn, and uh, my, my favorite moon, by the way, is a moon of Uranus called Miranda. Has anybody ever heard of Miranda? So Miranda is one of the interesting things to, to me is that Miranda is one of the smallest moons in the solar system that is still spherical. So it's right at that limit of hydrostatic equilibrium. And when you look at it, it looks like it's had an incredible geological history. And given that it's orbiting Uranus and Uranus has had giant impacts and all kinds of things happened that formed its rings, it's probably seen a lot of stuff. Uh, but, but that limit is around about 230 kilometers in, in diameter, which is about the diameter of, of Miranda. Anything smaller than that, it starts looking more like a potato than it does like a, like a sphere. Does that answer your question? Oh, right. so I, 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 I'm so sorry. Uh, so uh, hydrostatic essentially means that you have uh, forces that are uh, uh, driving towards the center, which is a gravitational effect. And so when you have uh, that force be equal in all directions, then it produces, it tends to smooth over the surface. Large enough objects, if they have enough mass and therefore enough gravitational pressure, they want to be round because it's, it's the same for all points on the surface. Anybody else? Oh, right here. A simple question. Um, you look up in the sky, you see all the stars. Is it um, likely that every star has planets? Yes, what we now know is that all stars have planets. Uh, this has uh, been one of these uh, e extraordinary things that when I was talking about the size of planets and I mentioned that distribution is kind of intuitive. Uh, it, it's also been intuitive that all stars have planets. We just weren't able to verify that until the last few decades. And the reason that that's intuitive was uh, all of our models of star formation and planet formation, it's, it's actually very, very difficult. People have tried to have stars form without planets forming from the material around them. And it's almost impossible to do that. So it's the only cases where you wouldn't have planets around a star is if you have, say for example, stars that are within a dense cluster of stars where significant passes of the stars to each other may have stripped the planets off and then you get what are called free floating planets which don't have a home uh, but in general uh, it seems that all stars have planets a question here what's the timing on the two new missions to uh, venus oh good question thank you i didn't mention that but the timing of those is that we're looking to deploy da vinci uh, in uh, 2031, and uh, Veritas is going to proceed, at, that's going to be 2029. Now, there's a bit of an issue there that some of you may have heard about, which is that uh, JPL has had some issues recently with managing the, uh, the vast amount of missions that it's, it's dealing with. Uh, and for example, it has Europa Clipper coming up, which is going to be an extraordinary mission to Europa. But, uh, but because of the various issues with its, with management of all of these, of all of these missions, it asked Veritas to temporarily stand down. And this is something that the Venus community is talking to NASA headquarters about because we actually really need Veritas to be there first because Veritas is going to be an orbiter that will be able to relay information from the Da Vinci probe, for example. A third component, which I didn't mention, was that soon after that announcement was made by NASA, the European Space Agency announced that they want to join in on the fun and they are launching a mission called Envision. So we're actually going to have an international fleet that's going to start to become crowded around Venus in about 10 years from now. Envision is, is due to arrive around about the same time as Da Vinci, which is 2031, 2032. So we're looking at around about eight years from now. 
How did the density of the atmosphere on Venus get so dense? And is the thinking that this atmosphere is homogeneous or is it uh, stratified in some way? Oh, that's that's a great question. So in in terms of uh, as as a function of altitude, it's definitely stratus, uh, stratified. So I did mention sulfuric acid. That sulfuric acid haze, for example, exists in a middle layer of the atmosphere. So there are definite uh, distinct regions within the atmosphere as a function of altitude as you go up, where the chemistry and the and 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 the composition is changing dramatically as as is the pressure and temperature but as you go around the surface at a given altitude it's extraordinarily homogeneous uh, and so it's 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 quite amazing how the temperature and the pressure and the composition of the atmosphere is at, at different locations on the surface in terms of how it got that way uh, and but this is a big question where we try and relate it the earth and uh, the, for me, uh, I sometimes invert the question insofar as not so, uh, not so much why is Venus's atmosphere so thick, it's why is Earth's atmosphere so thin? How, uh, because it's thinner than Titan's. Titan has a uh, 50% has thicker atmosphere than Earth. So Earth to me seems very much the weird one, certainly in terms of the composition because Everything else is dominated by the primordial materials from which the planet formed. That's why you see so much carbon dioxide on Mars as well as Venus. But then you look at Earth, and obviously it's been shaped by a lot of biological activity, as I'm sure both Tim and Eddie have spoken to. But, uh, but uh, Venus seems to be almost more of a natural state of if you have a planet which is degassing a lot of the the material and the gases that have been trapped during the formation then the, then the natural state for that is to is to be in the atmosphere earth is able to take some of that and lock it away again and i think earth is a really the unusual one there that's what we were talking about um when tim was here and again when eddie was here about how special and rare earth really must be um, but we have a question right here yeah, that's a great transition for the question. What is your assessment, given the incredible number of stars and planets that are out there? I don't, I don't have any idea how many, but it seems like an infinite number. What is your assessment of the fact of, of any one of those possible planets having life similar to what we have on our planet? What is your assessment of the possibility of that? The way I, 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 th I think about this, um, uh, you know, when, when I talk to my students about this and I, I start out by saying, you know, you've probably had these conversations and usually somebody at a party will say, well, look at everything that's out there. There, there must be something out there, you know, but, but we don't have to just rely on that. There are some things that we can quantify. First of all, like I said, we now know that small planets are far more common than larger planets and small planets are amongst the most common type of planet in the universe. So that means there's a lot of potential homes. So that's, that's good news. We also know when it comes to life on Earth, which is our only real data point for observing actual life evolution, that that started early, uh, as early as uh, 4 billion years ago. Uh, sometimes if I, if I uh, you know, pressure Tim into a corner, he might admit to 4.1. Um, but but we the point is is that it started soon after the Hadean, named after hell. You know, like you, you can't you couldn't have had life during that early period if you wanted to, because that when the Earth was still cooling off from its molten state, meaning that as soon as life was able to start forming on Earth, the evidence is pointing towards that happening quickly. So that if you had the, the necessarily ingredients, you had your bioessential elements, you had your carbon, your hydrogen, your nitrogen, your, your phosphorus and your sulfur, those sorts of things. You had those, you have liquid water, then you can get things moving along. That's that, based on the case of the, that's what that seems to, to indicate. So when we look at things like that, uh, my conclusion from this, or my expectation, if I were, if I were uh, a, betting money on this, then I would say that, that 
simple life, which has dominated most of Earth history, is extremely common. It's, it's out there in, in, in vast quantities. The evolution into more advanced life uh, has been relatively, overall has been relatively recent in Earth history. And, and Tim talks a lot about the rise of oxygen and how poisonous oxygen was for early life, but then it adapted and, and then we moved into the Cambrian explosion. The, and, but those sorts of things are relatively recently. And certainly intelligent life is extremely recent. And it's not clear that natural selection necessarily produces intelligence. Uh, Antarctic shrimp is like a, a vast amount of the Earth's current biosphere because it has reproduction and uh, adaption in the environment. So I imagine a universe that's completely full of Antarctic shrimp. <laughs> and and um, uh, because once you start talking about in, intelligent life, you start to overlay societal motivations and cultural implications of whether they would communicate with us and the Fermi paradox and many of the other things that I talk to my, my, talk to my students about. Just the biochemistry. Uh, I, I think there's probably a lot of uh, at least basic kind of life out there. Yeah, so it's uh, it's my understanding that uh, our cloud cover, our clouds, uh, have a significant are a significant factor on the temperature of our planet. Um, is that true? Number one, that that clouds are a significant factor on the temperature. Of the, of the earth yes yes uh, clouds are a very important part of uh what i refer to as the energy balance like whenever we run these models it's always about uh energy being received and energy being emitted and clouds are yes as, very so, big part of that I, so there's two follow-ups to that did venus ever have clouds or do they have clouds and then beyond that do we know a lot about the clouds on, on earth can we control them or you know, I know people try to see them and do different things to them, but maybe we could talk about that. We know a lot about the clouds on Earth, and that has the, the models that we use, uh, Earth-based models, for trying to simulate models that not only predict future climates, but climates on other planets and even exoplanets, uh, based on are quite sophisticated, and it's it's been interesting over the last couple of years, uh, where the computational power has coincided with the the instrumentation development that allows us to discover exoplanets so you've had many things happen in in parallel which has been great but uh when it comes to clouds on venus the issue there is that there are the, the the reason that we can't see the surface of venus not very very easily is because of the clouds. But these are clouds that exist at much higher temperatures and pressures that we've, that we've observed here on Earth. There are lab experiments that try to reproduce this, by the way. There's what we call Venus chambers, one of the largest of which is at NASA Glenn, uh, which are mostly looking at uh, testing hardware for, believe it or not, a rover on the surface of Venus, for which there is a proposal to do that. Uh, but in terms of testing, the, the, the chemistry as well is something that we try and do uh, within the lab here on Earth, but it's extremely difficult. Nothing that we observe within the Earth's uh, atmospheric structure looks anything like the chemistry that we see within the Venetian clouds. And so that's what's missing from our models, to be able to reproduce the physics and the chemistry and the composition at the pressures and temperatures of Venus to be able to simulate that, that properly. Is there any um, evidence of impact craters on uh, Venus, such as there is so much of in planets and um, at Mars and, and Earth and, and also in uh, the, our moon? And, and also, is there any evidence of um, uh, water movement, such as, uh, or evidence of water, previous water activity, such as has been found in Mars? Yeah, those are really great questions. Uh, I mentioned at one point during my talk that we know that the surface of Venus uh, is all uh, is around about the same age. About seventy percent of the surface of Venus 
is between 700 million to a billion years old. And one of the primary ways in which we determine that is from impact craters. And so we look at impact crater counts at various places on the surface. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the structure of the Venetian atmosphere is relatively uniform. And so we, uh, so we see a, lo a lot of the, the craters and it does, uh, one of the problems with the resurfacing event that happened on Venus is that it creates this blank slate before which there could have been liquid water oceans or it could have just been more of the same. And we're not really sure which of those is which. Uh, and the resurfacing has removed a lot of the impact craters. And so it's probably had a, a very similar crater history to, to Earth, but in the same way as those suffer from erosion on Earth's surface, it's a similar kind of situation for, for Venus. Um, your other question was? Water. What? Oh, sorry, the movement of water. Yes, so we, we don't see any evidence of movement of water, certainly not the same way in which we do on Mars. One of the uh, measurements that we're going to be doing in the coming years, and in particular the is that this is its primary science goal, is to look at differences between granitic rock and basaltic rock on the surface. Uh, bas uh, uh, basaltic rock being more common, at least on Earth, on the seafloor, and granitic rock being more common in the continents. And so if we can see a correlation of those between the higher altitude regions and the lower altitude regions, that might help us give us an indication if there were standing bodies of water at some point in, in the past. Uh, and the other piece of major uh, evidence I, I should mention is that there's uh, a high deuterium to ratio within the atmosphere of Venus, uh, which indicates that a lot of water evaporated at some point, sat in the upper atmosphere, and then was blown off into space. Uh, so that's another strong piece of evidence that it could have had liquid water in the past, but we need to verify that with more measurements. We're going to have one final question. Bob, you're it. Make it really, really, really good. I hope. Um, it seems that so much raw data is being generated by all these missions that it would really be hard to know what you have. It takes a, a bored scientist during a pandemic to notice what it means. Are there any attempts to use artificial intelligence to analyze all this data? And it would seem to me an ideal application. Right, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so I will say, there's, so there's a couple of things I'll, I'll say about that. Uh, you're right, there is a lot of data. Uh, this is a general problem, I would say, that exists within planetary science and, and certainly within astronomy. My as, astronomy colleagues, they sometimes liken it to drinking fire hose sometimes. We experienced this when the Kepler mission uh, was still active and producing uh, new planets because uh, we, we, it discovered thousands of planets, which was a much higher rate than it had been. And we simply, the people who really get a lot of these data. Uh, and so it's still uh, now, more than a decade later after the Kepler mission, the be made from that data. Uh, and in the case of the data that was for, for the recent discovery of volcanic outgassing on Venus, it was a combination of, of that, of that the, uh, that we, there was just a lot of data that hadn't been looked at yet. You also needed the right person which look at those data because he's, he's an expert in, in this field. Another piece of that is that the, for longest time, the data from Magellan was only available on CD. In order to see, to see, you had to actually ask for somebody to mail it to you. And it's only relatively recently that it was all made available electronically, which happily happened just prior to the pandemic. Uh, so there's all of these gener general issues, but to your question about AI, I will say that machine learning is uh, definitely something which has grown a lot over the last, I would say, five years. Uh, some of my colleagues are working with folks at Google Analytics uh, who have looked at a lot of similar kinds of data structures 
And so uh, I'm seeing a lot more results that are the result of machine learning processes being applied to a lot of these large data sets. So I'm hoping that, uh, that in the coming years, we will actually be able to catch up with, with, with the data because a lot of the times when we design these missions, they, they produce incredible data and data that's far better than we've ever had before, but we just don't have enough people uh, to look at it. And so obviously we're going to need to solve this kind of a problem. And I think machine learning and, and potentially AI is, is a way that we could do that. So we should ask chat GPT to, to look at all of the Venus data and tell us what finds. Good plan. So I just wanna say, Habitability, habitability, habitability. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for being here. And let's uh, ask him right now to come back and talk about either Venus or there was a plea for Pluto too, yep. which would be really interesting. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you all for coming. It's great having you.